Spaceship. Okay. You are. <laughs> you already know. That's not fair. <laughs> Ooh, people are really settling. Oh, they're very good. Well, we have 10 seconds. What a responsive audience. <laughs> Thank you for being so attentive. Um, I'm Ben Mardell, and I'm a researcher at Project Zero, um, the oldest research group at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's Ask With Forum. Um, it's wonderful to see um, old friends here and maybe have the opportunity to, to make new friends. Um, the Ask With Forums are um, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education's public lecture series on issues of great importance in education to foster learning and also action. And all the Ask With Forums are live streamed on the HGSE homepage and also our YouTube channel. Um, so welcome to people who are watching this around the world. And um, I hope that you're able to join us either online or in person at future Ask With Forums. So tonight's forum is called The Power of Playful Learning, Creating Educational S Settings that Bring Together school, school and Play Together. And I think that often per people's first association with play is fun or perhaps frivolity. But if you ask an evolutionary biologist why people and cultures all around the world play, why all our mammalian cousins play, the answer isn't because of fun, it's because of learning. That play has some essential characteristics, risk taking, creativity, collaboration, the use of imagination that are essential features of learning. And so since school is in the business of learning, wouldn't it be um, a good idea for play to have a, an important role in school? That's what we're going to be talking about for the next 90 minutes. So here is our agenda. So I'm going to start off with some introducing our panelists um, with something called replay, which you'll hear about in just a minute. And then we're going to play with a purpose. Um, we have an activity that will bring you into the problem space of school and play. Um, and then each of the panelists are going to share some of their current research on, on play in school. Um, then I have two questions for you guys. Um, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask the panelists some questions. Um, so let's just jump into the introductions, and I'll explain what replay is. Um, so I am um, one of the principal um, investigators, along with Daniel Wilson, on the Pedagogy of Play project. And because we know that playfulness is really a valuable mindset to have when you're together and learning in a group, we often start our group meetings with a ritual called replay, where people share one minute of playful experience from their work or family life. And so I've asked our panelists to help introduce them to you through, through replay. So um, we're going to start from the person who's come the farthest away. Um, Bo Thompson is, um, comes from Denmark to, to be with us, and he is the Vice President and Chair of Learning Through Play at the Lego Foundation. Um, in that role, Bo advises policymakers around the world about the importance of, of playful learning and also is involved with research, including this very topical um, research pro um, report that came out earlier this year. Um, Bo is also an architect. Um, and Bo, what kind of playfulness have you been up to in, in your life recently? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. So obviously, uh, I think the most obvious I could recall was I spent a few days holiday with my family uh, uh, last week, uh, which is the freedom to play and explore and so forth. But actually, what I also did was I was in a big forum called the Child Friendly Cities mm. with uh, 500 participants, uh, mostly mayors from all over the world. The first lady of Germany was sitting in the front. I was going to do the opening for these 500 participants. But along with me, I had a 12-year-old girl from, uh, from Denmark, and we were going to do the opening together. So we obviously talked about she had experiences around play and learning about what the environment means. And then as part of the preparation, she asked me, what happens if, uh, you know, I don't remember or something goes wrong? Uh, and I said, well, you know, you need to improvise. Like, it's perfectly okay. Sometimes I don't remember things either. And uh, doing the presentation there, and we had Lego bricks, and we were playing all participants and so forth. And I went a little ahead in my notes, a uh, little too much. And then she looked and said, 
well, that's all wrong. <laughs> Why do you do that? And then uh, in the middle of the state, and, uh, and then she began to improvise and do something else. That, for me, was playfulness. I think that was inherently courageous. Uh, it was fun. I learned a lot. And uh, she really just tried something else. Yeah. So in the middle of your talk, I'm going to signal you that you've done something wrong. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> OK. Um, so um, Susan McKay comes from almost as far away as, as Bo. Um, she comes from Portland, Oregon, where she is the pedagogical director for the Museum Center for Learning and the Opal School at the Portland Children's Museum. And the Opal is a public charter school where they describe their um, pedagogy of, as one of playful inquiry. Um, and really, I think I would say, Susan, your colleagues and you are at the cutting edge of bringing play and school together. Um, so Susan, what's your replay? Well, I thought about this. And um, I thought, oh, well, I could talk about, you know, dancing in the kitchen with my daughter, which is playful, or uh, the new set of watercolor paints that I got that I've been messing around with. Um, but as I was working this morning, it occurred to me, um, you know, as I was writing notes and thinking about this um, event this evening, and I was thinking, this is play, too, mm. right? This feels really playful to me. So deeply engaged with work that I've been deeply engaged in. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of primed to, to be in that, have that mindset when I sit down and make connections and, um, you know, just think of new, new ideas or whatever. And then about an hour ago, as we were, as we were sitting, getting ready to do this, and I got nervous and I thought about all of you and this event, it was much less playful all of a sudden. <laughs> and I thought that was really important um, to remember, you know, where mm -hmm. you sort of need to be sitting in order to enjoy the play part. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Susan. So Jack Shuncroft comes from a lot closer. His office is on Church Street, um, where he is the Julius B. Richmond Family Professor of Child Health and Development at HDSC and also the Harvard School of Public Health. Jack's also a professor of pediatrics at the Harvard Medical School and Boston's Children's Hospital. As an early childhood educator, I first encountered your work, Jack, in this groundbreaking um, volume, Neurons to Neighborhoods, um, and you're also the director of the Center of the Developing Child. Um, what have you been up to that's been playful, Jack? So it's, it's, it's great that we, we did not prepare in advance to see how each of our presentations go, so I'll kind of resonate to things that Susan said. First of all, I mean, this is uh, kind of nerve-wracking for me because I'm not an expert in play. So I'm with all of these experts here, and I have to demonstrate that I have something useful to say. So we'll kind of see about that <laughs> afterward. But in terms of my own playful experience, I was thinking a lot about um, playing recently with my grandchildren, who kind of raise, range in age from three weeks. So we, uh, that's a wow, different kind of play a... to uh, 12 years. But um, really interesting to look at the uh, th uh, play with a three-year-old play with a, like a concentration game where you have things, mm -hmm. cards covered and you turn them up. Is you can see how at that age um, the you're really on the cusp of playing to just by your own rules and then kind of figuring out what opportunities there are to learn some concepts that this play is structured to do. And it's nice to, it was, it was great to watch both the attention to kind of the way in which the play's been scaffolded by the adults and also not caring about having to do that all the time and mm -hmm. do it your own way. Um, and the older kids uh, playing board games and card games, which we love to do together, it's, it was just fascinating to think of the contrast about how, so they've, they've kind of incorporated the rules of play. Um, they play by those rules. They try to manipulate those rules when they have to. But just in those few couple of years, this whole notion of how serious is play, how much learning is involved in it, this notion of of whether you make up your own rules as you transition to kind of following the rules but still figure out a way to kind of have more agency and not just do what you're supposed to do is kind of a fascinating thing for me to watch um, in the joy of just being with my grandchildren. So I'll just kind of lay that out. Yeah, well, it's nice to hear how much joy being a grandfather can be. Um, I, one of my sons is in the audience, so it's good for him to hear. So um, <laughs> I, see that, I, I just I see, made a big problem. Has he graced problem. you with grandchildren yet? No, too young. Okay, yes, too young. <laughs> Stick around. Okay, okay so um, uh, moving along. Um, <laughs> When she's in the country, Lynette Solis just works up on the fourth floor with me at Project Zero. She's also done work um, at the Center for the Developing Child with Jack. Um, and she has her master's and her PhD 
here from HGSE. Um, her research on play in Colombia um, was recognized by the American Education Research Association's Early Education and Child Development Special Interest Group's Outstanding Dissertation Award. Um, and she's also done research in South Africa and Hong Kong. And Lynette, as part of the Pedagogy of Play team, you know the drill here. So Yes. Um. <laughs> um, well, my team knows that um, I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old niece, nieces, um, and they live in California, which means that for the majority or all of their life, I have not lived close to them. Um, but my sister and I have um, come up with this routine that I try to call them every day um, when schedules match up for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and when the uh, babies were really little, my sister and I would get to talk. But they're both at the age where I actually get to play with them. Mm. Um, and because I have been traveling so much, the four-year-old is really into pretending that we're flying to different countries. Um, so it's very nice to do this with my sister because she'll set up the situation, um, the airplane or the country that we're traveling to. And then for a few minutes in my day, I get to pretend that we're flying and that we are in first class. And, or, and that we're sleeping <laughs> or that um, we're going uh, to an exotic destination and we get to, you know, um, be at the beach or hike a mountain together. Um, and I think for me, it's been very special to build this relationship with my nieces, even though we're so far away. When I um, see them in person, it's like we haven't missed a day. Um, but importantly, it's created this time for my sister and I to connect um, as a new mother and someone who's usually um, sort of surrounded by kids and maybe not adults. It's been really nice to be part of that part of her life as, as a mother. So that's, that's my most recent replay. Okay, well, thank you all. And I think you'll get to, it was nice, I think, hopefully to hear a little bit about these people as players. Um, you'll hear more about their professional work in, in just a little bit. But before we go there, um, I have an activity for you that has to do with these sheets of paper. Um, and um, as um, I'm talking you through the directions, um, some friends and colleagues and family members are going to be passing them out. And here is the, um, what you, I'd like you to do. Um, I want you to work in pairs. And then with these sheets of paper, I want you to explore um, and keep track of any discoveries you make, any questions come up. You'll have about five minutes to do that. And then you'll turn to another pair. Um, and share some of your questions and discoveries. And I'll be your timekeeper. And the one other thing I'll say before you start playing is that you can use other resources that you have brought with you in your backpack or your purse or your pocket. So um, go ahead and work with your uh, new friend or an old friend and explore and um, have fun. Have one. So I'm going to wander okay, yes. and watch.
I was a kindergarten teacher before I started working here, so um, I still have my tools of the trade. But turn to another peer now and share um, some of what you, um, a question that you had or a discovery you made, and um, you have a minute or so to, to, to share, just to share um, some that, that you've been finding out. And why don't you go talk? So I'm going to bring us back together, and I'm going to bring our panelists back. Um, I'm imagining that some of you are curious about um, what I call magic paper. Um, so it's made by 3M. It's called Dic Dicrotic. Um, and if I got it sourced at a place called decorativefilm.com, um, it's not cheap. Um, but if you're interested, that's, you can just Google it, and that's where you might be able to find it. But this was play with a purpose, and I asked Susan and Jack actually not to, um, to explore and play, but to observe. And um, so Susan and Jack, in this few minutes, what learning was going on? Learning well, that's tough to to say yes. for sure. Yeah, no, that's right? a big question. <laughs> but um, I think that if I had offered this experience, then I would be offering it as an opportunity to listen and find out what what arose in the playfulness as there was exploration with that new material. And so I noticed things like, and then I would jot down what I was noticing. Um, I noticed that. You know, so many people kept lifting it up to the light and uh, and looking and experimenting with changing the way things look. Um, and I wondered if that was, you know, if there was some other curiosity there about what happens when you really can change the way you see things. Um, I heard a lot of people saying, I wonder if um, provisional theories being built, I think that. Um, an interesting thing that happened here was a recognition of um, how much perspective was at play in, in the um, collaboration as they were leaning in um, towards each other and towards the material. Um, one of them said, is it green for you? And the other said, well, it's green for me. And uh, so it depends on perspective. And then somebody asked, well, how do eyes work? <laughs> and so... And that really caught my attention, as I think it would in, in the classroom, because um, that, that's such a great place maybe to do some more exploring. Um, what I, one thing I know, I think it was people making theories and being really silly and connecting with each other and laughing. Um, I heard people making connections like, I think I've seen this thing somewhere before and trying to make sense of it. But what was interesting to me is when the two pairs went to share with somebody else, it suddenly got quite like, this was my theory and my explanation <laughs> about what happened. And so they wanted to really share, um, you know, about refraction of light and angles and things like that. Um, and then uh, 
But then another pair said, look, look, look what I made, and twisted it and said, look, it's a bouquet yeah. of colored lights. Isn't it beautiful? Um, and so that was a part of the play, too. So those are my observations. Thank you, Susan. Gonna... Jack, I'm not going to ask you how eyes work. But you could, <laughs> could explain that to us. But what, what, you were walking all around. What did you observe? This was great. I mean, I have to say um, I'm a little bit wary because this was a real con confirmation bias for me, mm. bias confirmation. Um, <laughs> I approach everything with this sense that heterogeneity and individual differences in response to the environment is the name of the game. Mm, okay. So I kind of, so guilty as charged, that's kind of what my mindset is. So I started walking around the audience and everything kind of looked about the same to me. Everybody was engaged. I was expecting um, more people to kind of be looking like, what am I supposed to do with this thing? <laughs> but, but there was very little of that. So um, I was starting to get a little bit nervous about what the heck am I going to say about this. So I started to talk to people. And all of a sudden, wow. So I'm going to preserve confidentiality here. But the responses <laughs> ranged from, this is so much fun. I am loving this so much. And people putting it up against the computer, putting lights through it, shining it, crinkling it. I asked uh, one group, of, uh, one pair, about whether um, it would be as much fun um, if you're doing it by yourself as mm. opposed to doing it with each other. And uh, was one pair said, oh, you know, this is so much fun. I think it would be much more fun doing it together. I'm glad we're paired. Another pair said, this is fun, but I'm taking this home and I'm going to do it by myself. <laughs> so um, it could work either way. And then two people to whom I promised anonymity, one person said to me, I hate these things. I hate going to these things where you have warm-up activities. It's not, it's, not, it's not really what I came here for. And then one person, I'm going to make eye contact, can I divulge your identity or not? You can decide afterwards, because mm. I decided to go to the mountaintop and ask a, like somebody who's like really you know, like an icon, so what do you think about this? And he said, well, I hate that people tell me what to do. Uh, so uh, anyway, I'll maintain confidentiality. So, so for me, this was kind of really a wonderful sense of how in a very non-representative audience of adults, yeah. um, there's tremendous variability in how people play with this, how they do it themselves with each other's, like it, don't like it, but almost everybody kind of followed the instructions, whether they liked it or not, and started playing, so food for thought. Interesting. Actually, so we, we didn't obviously plan out what Jack was going to share, but it really sets up a question that I have for you about this, which is how playful, much playful learning was going on for you? And I want you to imagine a playful learning meter, um, where if all the way to the right, it's a lot of playful learning was happening for you. And there might be three in the middle, or it might be all the way to one, not that you ate this stuff. Um, and uh, and I, there's really no, I have really want honest answers. Um, but I'm wondering, for how many of you was this a five? This was tremendously playful learning going on for you. So handful of you. Um, how much is four? It was really pretty much playful learning. So more hands. Cool. Three, kind of in the middle, yes, but um, well, uh, okay. Two, a little bit, but not so much. Um, um, one, you hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of have a bell curve, maybe skewed a little bit to not as playful, but it immediately brings up a uh, a problem for people who want to design playful learning experiences, which is what's playful for one is not what playful for all. So you can't just say to somebody, play, have fun, and learn. It's not going to work. Um, and that's a problem if you want to bring more play into school. Um, there are other problems as well, um, in particular that the nature of the paradoxical nature of play with school. Um, and that's something that we talk a bunch about at the Pedagogy of Play Project, and I just want to briefly share with you that, um, that things like play is timeless. Players lose themselves in time, where school has timetables. Um, play can be loud, messy, chaotic, and schools at least aspire to be places of order. Play involves risk. And in school, we want children to be safe. And both of these are good and true. We want children to explore, but we don't want them to get hurt, right? Um, in play, children are in charge. In school, generally, the agenda is set by someone else, adults, you know, the teacher, the school head, the Ministry of Education, but it's not kids um, leading their own learning. And in play, 
you know, the players create their own culture, the, the, the rules, the characters. Um, school is generally seen as a place to transmit culture. So you heard from Susan and Jack that I would say that, that there was a fair amount of learning going on because there were a lot of questions, there was collaboration, there was some imagination, there was some storytelling. So even in five minutes, there were some people that were really doing some playful learning here, but it's not so easy to bring play and learning together. And that's the problem space that our um, four um, panelists are working in. And so I'm going to ask, actually, um, turn to them now. And we're going to hear five minutes or so for each of what some of the, what they're thinking on. Um, so Susan, um, you are head of a, lear a school, a <laughs> learning organization, with the youngest are three and the oldest are almost as old as I am. Mm, yeah. um, um, so um, what have you been thinking about? <laughs> Great. Um, well, uh, a lot of the things that you just um, that you just brought up. This is Senin. I'm going to tell you a little story about, about him. Um, but I want to just back up just a little bit that, uh, and let you know that um, Opal School is this very tiny uh, school in Portland, Oregon. That's a program of our Children's Museum. And it was started in 2001. Um, when a group of teachers got together, and really this was their question, you know, what are the implications for playful learning um, within an American public elementary school context? And so for the last 18 years, we've been exploring that question through stories, like the one that I'm going to share with you here. And I thought that probably that was the best role that I could play, um, was take you right into a classroom, into a, what was a really small moment in time um, that we think uh, was a kind of a, a good example of a moment that taught us a lot about um, the possibility here. So um, this is Senin, and the, he was a fifth grader in this picture. Um, the children at Opal School oftentimes go, like so many other uh, schools, go off on kind of a, a ropes course early in the school year to do some community building and um, stretch themselves a little bit. Um, and so these children had just come back from that experience. And as fifth graders at Opal School, they're really familiar with being asked to play with materials um, in order to create some ideas. Um, the teacher wanted the children to do some writing, to reflect on their experience, you know, what had, what had they learned um, in doing this ropes course. And so she offered them clay um, because she was predicting that if they used the clay, they would be able to get down into a level of thinking and reflection on that experience that they wouldn't have so much access to if we just asked them straight out, what did you learn in this experience? So everybody had a piece of clay. It was supposed to be this, you know, kind of quiet, reflective, kind of independent experience. Um, and so the teachers are watching. Kids each sort of are set up like Senin is there. And I guess you're back here. Um, and he uh, discovered what happens when you can put water, you mix water with clay and you stick your finger in, right? You, you can imagine the sound that he can make <laughs> with that. And then when you're, it's like hilarious, right? <laughs> so pretty soon, every kid in the class is much more entertained by Senin and the noises that he can make with his clay than this reflection on this experience. And so the teachers in that moment, right, they have this really big choice to make. And um, what do you do <laughs> when this, this whole thing seems like it's being derailed and uh, you want them to do this pur purposeful work and reflective work, meaningful work? So that went on for just enough time, just enough pause for Senin to really fill his clay up with some water, and the whole thing just kind of collapsed in the middle. And he saw something new in it, and started to suddenly, when that happened, got much more focused on the clay, and sort of forgot about um, the other children laughing around him. And he, um, so you see, he got super focused. He added himself into this clay, and then he was ready to write. And here's a piece of what he write, wrote. He said, it's like a hollow feeling. When you fall down, you fall into this, you start to swing. You fall into a hole. It's slippery inside, and you have no idea what's going on. My body shut itself down, and I closed my eyes, and I thought I was dreaming. I was super happy after I did it. You have to face your fears. And so, you know, the teachers were really, I mean, it could have gone the other way, right? They could have just evolved into the chaos. But the teachers were, um, were, you know, 
glad that they had taken that momentary pause to see what might happen next. Um, and so, and that's allowed us to, you know, transfer that moment um, to other teachers, but mm -hmm. to, to other children too in the school um, and recognizing that there's some possibility there. Um, I think that, uh, you know, a long time ago, I heard Jerome Bruner say that um, the object of school should be to make learning less dangerous, right? And that if you don't play enough in school, then there's just too much consequence. And I think this story really is representative of that um, that moment when the con consequence is reduced, not for the teachers, <laughs> but for the children, reduced enough to a point that they can think things that they couldn't have thought. I mean, the consequence is immediate when you're told that you need to, you need to do this piece of writing. Um, but the work with materials allowed him to get down to a place where this idea that he has to face his fears can be transferred to so many other situations in his life. And, and we find that that's, that's the power of this work. Thank you, Susan. Yeah. So Lynette, um, you literally do research all around the world. Mm -hmm. So um, why don't you share what you've been thinking about in terms of this? Sure. Um, so the work that I do um, that focuses on the sociocultural context of play, both in my own research, but also the research that I've been um, doing with the um, Pedagogy of Play project, acknowledges the benefits of playful learning, the benefits in learning and development that play can contribute um, to children and adults. Um, but it also highlights that uh, play is culturally determined. Um, so. Um, even though play is a universal experience, it's also a cultural construct. And so who children play with, when they play, where they play, um, when they're supposed to stop playing, if ever, is determined by the priorities of their communities, by the re resources available, um, by the role of play in, in the learning goals that their teachers and their schools have determined for them. Um, and so in my work, I try to highlight um, that when we try to bring playful learning into schools, into communities, it's also important to acknowledge what are those priorities and what are the existing experiences of children and their communities. This is especially important because the majority of research that has been done on play and playful learning has been conducted in middle income Western countries. So what we know about play and what it looks like and the benefits that it can have on children and their learning is really, really limited. Not that we don't um, think that this evidence is important, but we do acknowledge, or, or at least I try acknowledge, to acknowledge in my work, that, it, that if we try to take the current models of what playful learning can look like in schools without testing what local teachers, what local families define as play, we might actually be imposing a very different type of playful learning um, than what's um, valued in the communities we work in. So um, in the Pedagogy of Play project, we have been asking this question, what does playful learning look and feel like in different cultural contexts? And what are the community experiences and routines that build this type of um, playful learning culture in schools? Um, we've been doing this by, it, we started in uh, 2015 in Denmark at the International School of Billund, where our um, funder and thought partner Lego Foundation is based. Um, and we asked teachers and, and students and explored the literature about what, it, what does it feel like and look like in this school um, to experience playful learning. But then we thought, we can't take this model of what we've discovered here in Denmark um, and take it somewhere else. So we then um, worked in South Africa in three diverse schools to ask the same question. Um, and have started doing that work here in Boston and hope to go to other cultural contexts. But I just want to share a little a snippet of what we have found just in two cultural contexts. So um, by working with different school communities, we came up with models of what um, constructs were used in those local contexts to define what playful learning could look like. In Billund, at the International School of Billund, we found that teachers and, and students were talking about choice, 
There were uh, talking about wonder, the experience of wonder, and the experience of delight. And under each one of these, if I had more time, I would tell you specific indicators of what choice, wonder, and delight look and feel like in classrooms. But then when we went um, to South Africa and worked across three contexts, teachers were talking about ownership, uh, students owning their own learning, curiosity, and enjoyment. Um, and you can see some overlap here. Both uh, models talk about a sense of agency, students leading their own learning. They both talk about this sense of wonder or curiosity, and they both talk about joy. Uh, but what having two models allowed us to do is to use the constructs and the language that are accessible to, to local students. And the most um, explicit example of this was that in the context of South Africa, the idea of Ubuntu, or the philosophy that I'm an individual through other people, came up as critically um, defining what it meant to be a playful school. So the fact that we were cheering each other on, that we were invested in each other's learning, was critical to the way that students and teachers talked about playful learning. So if we think about this, we can start to de um, design tools that are um, generative to that culture and to that group of students and to um, the communities that they belong to. Um, so as we continue our conversation on what playful learning um, looks like, I just um, invite us all to question for whom, by whom, um, and define for what purposes. So here we're not thinking about a monolithic way of implementing playful learning in schools, but rather inviting schools to have these conversations of the paradoxes between um, play and school in their context. Thanks for that. So Jack, you guys do so many different things at the Center for the Developing Child. <coughs> it's probably unfair to ask you to share in five minutes, but that's what I asked you to do. So. <laughs> So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to share how our thinking and our uh, kind of vision of what our center is about has changed okay. in that context. So we started out uh, really interested in thinking about how uh, leveraging the revolution in 21st century biology could, um, could bring some new thinking into the interface between kind of research and service delivery on the one hand and policy on the other to make the case for why investing in the early years is so important. So um, what I'm going to do in this slide is basically say that part of what we're doing is kind of look, uh, trying to leverage. I don't do this research myself. Um, what we understand about the neural circuitry of the core skills um, in life that begin very early, that of the foundations of resilience. And they're shaped by um, kind of inborn drives, modeling, coaching, and learning through play was something that um, we came to naturally. So we're talking about executive function skills. I'm having a hard time looking at this, but I kind of remember what's on this slide. You know, it's being able to focus your attention, to kind of set goals, to kind of develop a plan, mm -hmm. to kind of switch what you're doing when what you're doing isn't working out too well, control your impulses, delay gratification, uh, engage in goal director. All of those executive function self-regulation skills, which we didn't start out thinking about as the kind of biological substrate in the neural circuitry for play, but obviously it very much is because this is kind of where in the brain. There's no play center. There's no play lobe in the brain. But a lot of these skills basically cannot be learned and cannot be mastered by didactic teaching. They're learned through um, all the things that, that, you know, have been spoken about before, and these variations of curiosity and, and wonder and exploration. So... Um, what I want to do now is kind of take this and show you, uh, put out two of my favorite pet peeves uh, that come from this that just kind of throw it out for thought. Yeah. So for starters, um, these cognitive, emotional, and social capabilities that are built in play in whatever cultural context you live in, they're highly interconnected within the architecture of the brain. So we know that the amygdala, where a lot of the fear circuitry is yeah. developed very early on, plays a role here, the hippocampus with memory and simple learning, and then the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of where a lot of these higher level functions uh, come in um, on a genetic program, but shaped by experience, shaped by the opportunities kids have. Um, however, um, I'm going to kind of put a big slash against two ways in which we should absolutely stop talking about these skills mm -hmm. and stop talking about what it is that play 
is kind of facilitated. One is these are not soft skills. They're as hard as any other skills in the brain. Uh, they have hard circuitry. They've got a clear biology. There's nothing soft about them. So let's stop saying that play is where you build soft skills. Um, they're also not 21st century skills. I mean, God knows. I mean, the context is different, but I think they, were prob they have been as relevant um, since uh, the first uh, kind of primate got up on two legs and kind of walked along. So um, the context is very different. 21st century challenges are different, but let's stop calling these calling play the way to develop 21st century skills and soft skills. That's not what they are. So I'm going to kind of end. How am I doing on time? Can I take my time on this last one? So, so biology clearly drives us to play. I mean, a number of people have made uh, reference to this. Um, but it's the environment that scaffolds um, increasingly complex capabilities as we grow up that play allows us to develop. So and I have to say, you know, I rushed to meet the deadline to get this slide deck in last week. Uh, I'm embarrassed by the lack of pictures that reflect more of an international perspective. I apologize to this audience. This is very North American centric. I actually have another set of slides. I could have done a better job on this, but forgive me for this. So first of all, it was already mentioned. Um, it's, ba it's built into biology. Animals play. It's an important way in which they learn. This is not even a matter of, of just the importance of cultural context. That's the environment but the biology applies everywhere. So playful interactions, they kind of start in infancy. They include uh, engagement with or without adults in terms of manipulation of, of opportunities for learning the environment. As kids advance into the preschool years, they get to play and master concepts of evolved cognitive flexibility, a lot of other very important executive function skills. Um, imaginary and creative play is obviously another part of that. Engaging in social play with other children, with adults. Scaffolding this is kind of play. You could have an adult in a room with children with some scaffolding, and it can still be very playful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean yeah. that it's didactic. Um, kids can play without adults in all kinds of games, but this is the one I want to leave you with. Um, so this is meant to depict. This is kind of a human-centered design session with adults trying to figure something out. Um, we have really um, created a terrible monster in the way that we uh, approach what the kind of the, the power of the academic world has to contribute to playful learning, new approaches to early childhood education, intervention. Um, uh, we have um, taken away from adults uh, knowing how to play mm. with ideas. We've strangulated a lot of what we've done. I'm, it's an interesting tension. On the one hand, um, I actually appreciate the demands and the rigor of, uh, of, of following conventional rules of how to study things mm -hmm. and how to find out what's working and what's not. But if it ends there and there's no room for hypothesis generation and playing with ideas and playful mm -hmm. thinking, uh, we get what we have, which is a field that is uh, kind of not made as much progress as it needs to make in terms of how we create better learning environments for young children and the adults who care for them. Done. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jack. Good charge for all of us here at uh, the Ed School. Um, so, Bo, you um, go around the world talking to policymakers, um, have lots of really interesting conversations. What's on your mind? On my mind right now is I'm really stuck by the image that, lo that Lions is in North America. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> but beyond that, um, they're constrained in cages. <laughs> <laughs> They're not we allowed take really play. You know, we're American. We claim yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm spending my time in a different way. But um, <laughs> yeah, so the Lego Foundation, we, we partner up with research institutions and we work in uh, con more than 20 countries uh, on ground to support teachers and parents and schools to implement learning through play. Not only Lego bricks, but play in all forms and aspects, uh, so that's important to say. So what I'm going to talk a little bit about is uh, our aim to systemically reach uh, children we learn through play. So what really on our mind is how can we work with governments, multilateral institutions, and connect that ambition from a government and international perspective with underground needs of parents and teachers and schools to implement uh, learning through play through, through a shared language and through evidence. Um, and that work is, uh, you know, quite difficult in the sense that um, play do not exist as a ministry or as a department. Doesn't even exist yet as a as an institute in a, in a, in a research institution. But we do have pedagogy of play and, and good places like that. Uh, so, and even children does not have like its own department or ministry. Uh, so it's basically scattered different places. 
But I think there's a good news, which we realize right now, is there's kind of a movement towards playful learning in many aspects. Um, so many of the dialogues we're in, in the UN, General Assembly, the World Economic Forum, OECD, uh, Global Education Skills Forum, national governments are actually beginning to talk about play because they're talking about a very different set of skills, and I think that movement is quite interesting. It's not, you know, on top of mind that we want talking about markets and trades and conflicts and uh, all that aspects, but there's a, at least a few issues. So uh, an increased need to respond to growing issues of inequality is an area where play has a huge role to play in response to new technologies. It's also, but the most important we see is a new kinds of skills outlook. And I think uh, Jack touched upon that a little bit. So there may not be new skills in the outlook of, uh, you know, uh, 2,000 years of, uh, of history of kind of modern world. But if you look at the World Economic Forum, you know, it is really important to address a very different set of skills. Uh, and if one look at the skills outlook here, you know, these are the important things that should be addressed uh, as aims of what we think about learning. Uh, and if we kind of don't, you know, keep in mind that there's a different set of skills, we're kind of stuck in kind of old ways of learning, and we are kind of stuck in impractical, non-effective solutions. And if you look at what's up here on the left side, it's basically creativity. It's embedded in, uh, in the top ten in different aspects, originality, problem solving, innovation, ideation. It's also critical thinking, as you see up here, analytical thinking, evaluation, dealing with pro complex problems. There's a great focus on social and emotional skills coming up now, not only in terms of social influence and collaboration, but, but empathy is actually mentioned here as one of the top ten skills that, that people should be looking for uh, in a few years. And if you look at the top right side, so working with our partner Brookings Institution, they map the different governments, what is on their government agenda in terms of skills, what is mapped in the value statements, in the curriculum, and the, what they're trying to implement. And what came up there is creativity, problem solving, collaborations are top skills that people are looking for. And if you look at the lower right, uh, we just came out two weeks ago from the launch of the new OECD uh, aim for the new uh, assessment is creativity and critical thinking to be part of 2021. So I think we're actually looking towards a very different landscape of skills, uh, at least attention to a very different landscape of skills, which goes beyond traditional uh, content. What we also see is if you look at the parents, actually agree on play being able to address these kind of skills. So this is uh, our uh, Play Well report from last year. And uh, these are the percentages of parents who say, well, actually, play does support problem solving, creativity, communication, socializing. On the right side, they even say it's very important for school and it's important for lifelong learning. So there's a momentum among parents to say play is extremely important, not only in terms of the skills, in terms of schools, but for lifelong, lifelong learning and to, to thrive in society. So when we combine that, we looked at a review uh, earlier this year to say, well, how if you bring together the understanding of play, engagement, joy, what you were, what you were basically doing just uh, 30 minutes ago, how does that appear in a school environment? And what we realized is if we bring play into schools, we have a kind of a win-win benefit here because play supports high engagement. Children really want to be engaged and motivated to learn. You support that deeper understanding of science concepts, mathematical understanding, reading, and so forth, but you also develop skills. So actually, you combine engagement, content, and skills if you think about playful learning experiences. And there are particular kind of pedagogies that do that pretty well. So this is a review across 18 different countries, empirical studies, to say the active engagement, meaningful experiences, still allowed to experiment, try things out. They get a deeper understanding of the topics. And through active learning, problem-based, inquiry-based, project-based learning, they also develop problem-solving, creativity, collaboration along science and reading and engineering. So, you know, that's not really a concern in that sense. It might not be the fast solution, but actually, if you think about what governments look for, and what play is able to support, it actually seems like there's a really growing attention to this. So of course, there are critical issues. So how do we enable that? And this is the last slide to say, we do summarize some of the factors that needs to be in place, which is what we are keen to, to, to address right now. So for instance, you know, it's really a integra an integrated pedagogy among teachers, not only free play, not only instruction, but being able to address individual needs moving from 
not only important play in early childhood, not only climbing trees, but also support inquiry and guidance in the classroom. It needs to be very practical, practical and culturally relevant. Assessments need to be alternative. So we don't only have standardized assessments to keep the governments and everyone accountable, but actually uh, multiple types of assessments, portfolio, surveys, self-assessments are the most effective ways to think about learning. And teachers deal with very practical things like classroom management. So if one is going to support playfulness, you know, how do one manage the multitudes of materials and different children in the classroom? There needs to be strategies to support that. And lastly, what we also see and what I hear here from the projects here, if there's not a, a, a commitment and support from the community and the parents, you know, this can never really, uh, really uh, be implemented because their kind of support understanding that play should be in schools and it is kind of an approach that is acceptable, it's important, but also that they bring resources themselves uh, to that work. So I'd say, uh, I think we are very optimistic in the way that governments and international organizations are beginning to think about skills and creativity and diversity in a way that actually can have great potential for play to be a, a solution in that area. Cool. So, thank you, all four of you. For I know that it's not simple or easy to synthesize really big ideas and, and things that are so important in your life to um, to five minutes of, of uh, and a few slides. But I really appreciate um, all four of, of you, you shared a lot with us. And, in a short amount of time, but you're not off the hook yet <laughs> because I have two questions for you. Um, and the first question is, um, is learning through play for all? Um, and that question is motivated by a review of this book, um, Let the Children Play by Passy Salberg and William Doyle. Um, and I, I imagine that you guys are familiar with it, but the review is by a guy named Chester Finn, who is a... Um, fellow at the Stanford Hoover Institute. He was a Bush administration education policy and, um, official. And Finn definitely comes down on the side that playful learning in school is not for all children. Um, and this is what he wrote in his review of the book. We have ample evidence that while playful teaching and learning does little harm to middle class kids with support and structure in the rest of their lives, for children from troubled circumstances, it's a recipe for failure. Many such youngsters already have plenty, quote, play, unquote, of various sorts in their lives, even a corrupted sort of, quote, natural state, unquote, but precious little formal learning. And few of other benefits, character formation, self-discipline, citizenship, etc., that also flow from purposeful education, adult direction. Um, so I'm going to actually turn to you, Bo, because I'm curious. You come from outside of our country, but is this this is a, is this a conversation in Denmark? Are people saying playful learning is for um, is fine for kids that from families that have a lot of money, but if for for poor kids, um, playful learning is not relevant? And and if yes or no, what do you make of this in uh, hearing this kind of argument? Hmm. Right, well, uh, it is certainly an argument we hear many places, mm -hmm. also in Denmark, okay. uh, particularly when we think about the push towards academic learning, and mm. is it really a solution for the hard skills and uh, uh, academic skills and so forth? Mm. Uh, but but uh, I'd say that, <laughs> you know, I think the argument is also is a current system really for everyone. Mm. I think that uh, what we see in many places is many children struggle to keep up with the current uh, system and uh, low engagement, uh, low basic uh, understanding, social emotional skills and so forth. Of course, playful learning is for everyone. Mm. Like the evidence clearly support that, you know, playful learning is an opportunity to address individual needs, different materials, being able to flexibly adjust your classroom, listen to each individual child. It's not easy, but it is for, for everyone. Mm. The key difficulty is, and there's some really nice uh, economic studies around that, is if families are really struggling and, you know, they have to make a living and it's a failure if the child is not able to get through the school system, Obviously, it's a, it's, it's a hard choice to, to say to the child, you shouldn't like sit and drill and do your homework. You have to do fun. We have to play mm -hmm. because uh, the risks and the stakes are so high. Right. So I think that's a push for, for certain families and where they come from, which makes it very difficult to prioritize play when there are standardized and, 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 and school expectations that are so high. 
but generally plays for all, like it supports basic things like symbols and language, mathematic quantify sorting, self-regulation, executive functioning. So it's just a, it's a pity that that kind of misconception exists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Jack, I think you know the, well, you obviously know the research really well. Is Chester Finn onto something or is he on something? What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> is he on something? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I, I just think it's, it's, it's the wrong question and it's the wrong language. Uh, so yeah. what's the alternative? Learning by not enjoying what you're doing? Mm. I mean, I, I think this notion somehow play is a code word for recess mm -hmm. or a code word for take a break from learning and just let your mind go off in, in all kinds of directions. I, I, I think there are different ways in which... Um, learning can be enjoyable mm -hmm. and in some cases be lots of cases be playful and in some cases uh, I, you know I think this my sense is this is coming from more of a sense of, stru of structure versus non-structure mm -hmm. or adult directed versus child directed and I know that one of the things I learned actually at one of the Lego conferences from Kathy Arshpasik and Roberta uh, Golenkoff was that they have gone through an evolution in their own mm -hmm. yeah. work where they used to think that all of the important play was child-directed and have come around to feeling like, no, that's not right. There's a need to be a mix of child-directed and more adult kind of scaffolded learning, um, which by this definition may be, well, the, the adult scaffolded part is, mm -hmm. is okay. Um, but I just think it's, it's the wrong language. It's the wrong question. Um, if play is a synonym for having fun, and learning is a synonym for being serious. Mm -hmm. okay. you know, I, that just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Lynette or, or Susan, jump in. I think there's several unwarranted assumptions in the statement, mm -hmm. starting with the one about playful learning not providing support uh, and scaffolding, which um, I think that all of us would agree that the best type of playful learning actually has a level of support and structure. Whether it's adult directed or not, there's a there could be a continuum of whether that's, there's adult direction or not. Um, but I think that there's also an assumption that um, children in different circumstances have opportunity to play. Actually, the research does not show that children who uh, uh, live in difficult circumstances, refugee children actually have decreased levels of um, play because of the higher levels of stress. On the other hand, research shows that play actually provides coping strategies for children with high stress that actually allows their brain to focus on other aspects that are important in their classrooms. Um, and so when we think about playful learning, um, sort of providing opportunities for children in all circumstances to reduce their level of stress. Um, given um, current life circumstances, I think it, we can see that it, uh, um, it's appropriate for all children. Um, and finally, things like character formation, self-discipline, and citizenship um, have actually been um, shown to uh, be related to aspects of playful learning. Um, and I think if we break down the, the statement, there's several things that could be backed up or, or um, push back on based on the research we have on play. I would just add, I mean, with yes, yes, and I, I think that, like, I don't see, in this question, there's, a, there's sort of, a, it's a technical question, yeah. but it's also really a political question, right? It's a question about, you know, um, who gets to diagnose the situation um, and who's subject to the direction that, that comes from that diagnosis who gets to be a producer of ideas and who is supposed to reproduce ideas. There's a, there's a, uh, you know, a real deficit paradigm that is around providing context for that statement. Um, and inside that deficit paradigm lives this racist narrative, right, that, that there's a, something inherently wrong, <laughs> something inherently wrong with certain, um, certain people and certain families. Um, and so there's, a, there's sort of a self-fulfilling 
cycle here that um, that children are are fed these you know incredibly low nutritional value <laughs> experiences yeah. in school and then don't perform well on the measures that somebody's decided are the measures to use um, as almost you know reinforcing and confirming that deficit paradigm again um, and I, I read something that Toni Morrison wrote this morning, um, she said, you know, that, that um, racism is a, a scholarly pursuit, right, <laughs> and that it always has been, and that uh, it's not like the tides, right, or like, you know, the cycles of the moon or something like that, and that's not gravity, <laughs> and we can uninvent it, but yeah. the only way that we uninvent it is with imagination for something different. And the only way that we heighten and strengthen our imagination, our capacity for social and civic imagination, is in school and in opportun mm -hmm. having opportunities to play, right? So, um, so I wanted to add that yeah. to the mix because I think it's really important. Mm -hmm. Well, my second question for you, I think, follows along on this, which is um, thinking about um, Play in serious times. So I think it's, I think maybe we won't disagree. I don't think anyone would disagree that we live in serious times. Um, countries, communities have serious political, environmental, social issues. And schools are places, as Susan was just saying, where we're raising the next generation to, to take on these challenges. And, and so in these serious times, is play really what we need? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it is. I, I was hoping it would be more than a yes or no question. So. <laughs> right. Well, you know, if, if we think about, like, what is, what is political, it's, it's our, uh, how to navigate our coexistence together, bottom line, right? And, mm. and play is, is where we learn how to do that. Play gives us all the opportunity we need to bump into each other, um, to, to mess around with alternative perspectives, to hear ideas that we wouldn't otherwise hear, and, and, and play with them. Right. Ask big questions that nobody knows the answer to yet and uh, and work together and navigate conflict. And um, and those are those are all the skills that we need. There's nothing that's happening in these serious times. that doesn't happen on the playground. It's the same thing. Right? <laughs> really serious, difficult problems come up on the playground every single day. And so um, we have an opportunity to work uh, with children to navigate those complexities of, of living life together um, and play is the best way to do that. Well, isn't there a sign in the fifth grade at Opal School, um, why do we have outside time? Am I? Mm, and there's probably. three reasons, <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly, it's to, to have fun, um, to move around, and to um, find out conflicts that we can crack open and talk about in the classroom or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And it was not a teacher direction, it was, it was a, a fifth grader who was coming up with that. So. Jack, you seem like... Um, so, uh, without it in any way taking away from the importance of this distinction between play and didactic education, mm -hmm. um, I think the serious times, and one could say that it's just the latest version of serious times, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, this country was founded on slavery, right, on the compromise around slavery for a long time. I, I think the real issue here is the value context in which kids grow up. Right? So you could, um, whether it's play, whether there's more playful appreciation of playful learning, whether people think you need to inculcate certain information in kids' heads, it's all in the, con if we're talking about things like citizenship and character and, and, um, and those kinds of issues, um, I don't think the question is whether play or uh, kind of didactic education is the best way to do it. It's what's the value structure that's deciding what kids how kids should be raised, mm -hmm. um, how, what, how they should learn, um, how, they, how they should be able to be uh, enabled to think. Mm -hmm. And all of those things that are, um, I, I, to me, the problem, without in any way taking away from the core importance and topic of this session, is the value context in which we have an argument about whether playful learning or didactics is the way to prepare kids to succeed in a society. We have a values problem here more than a 
pedagogic challenge without diminishing the pedagogic challenge, at least for the question that you've put on the right, table. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe Susan and I were talking this morning about, uh, here's a play on words, but what's in play in a classroom, right? And, and I mean, we could facilitate playful learning for bigotry and racism, mm -hmm. and you could, I mean, it's just, it's, um, it, it doesn't automatically follow mm -hmm. that, um, that providing that kind of environment will produce um, the kind of co society you mm -hmm. want. Mm -hmm. That's right. But I think, as um, Susan mentioned, um, is it, it's through the imagination that we can imagine an alternative um, structure, um, and I think that that might be where play it comes in handy. Um, I think some of the most compelling evidence for me about how play uh, changes the mind, the brain, is. Um, that it prepares um, individuals to respond to other people's, uh, to other individuals, mm. and to respond to uncertainty in the future. Um, so the most compelling evidence <laughs> of this comes from um, animal models. We don't have this kind of research in, in humans, but research where rats, for example, are not allowed to play versus are allowed to play, um, and then followed to adulthood, you see that rats that were allowed to play um, are able to respond to another rat's move um, in a more productive way than a rat that was not, um, and also to respond to the uncertainty of the environment. Of course, there's lots of caveats in terms of uh, using animal models to talk about humans, but I think if we, if it's not hard to see that this happens in even in early childhood classrooms where children are being exposed to other children, perhaps for the first time, and learning to read other people's emotions, respond productively so we can continue the game, and also figure out the direction of a narrative or, or of, a, um, of the game we're playing. Um, and I think it prepares children, as you were saying, uh, Bo, t for the uncertainty that our future will certainly um, mm. pose for us. Mm. For the next hour. Mm. Yeah, for sure, yes. Mm. I, if I can just add one thing yeah, to go ahead. kind of elaborate on my last point before my time ran out in the five minutes, <laughs> is that I, I think one of the biggest crises is that we have not created an environment where adults can kind of play with ideas and alternative strategies mm. and be more creative about how to deal with the challenges we're facing. And mm -hmm. we've put so much constraint around um, the way in which we deal with these complex problems by either uh, making, uh, either over controlling the extent to which um, we will give credence to anything as evidence or knowledge, mm. or under controlling the sense that, you know, um, basically uh, any ideas about what to do are equivalent. We have serious problems that need creative thinking. Yeah and that need uh, better solutions and the capacity to implement those. And if, the, if anything calls for a playful learning approach with play being serious as opposed mm -hmm. to being just fun, um, it's the challenges facing adults who kind of want to create a better society and come up with better strategies than just um, pontificate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, one of my favorite quotes is by um, a primatologist from Chile, Isabel Bakhtin. She, she wrote, Paradoxically, it might be that when the situation seems the most serious and play seems the most inappropriate, that playful learning is needed most. So, mm. um, okay, you guys still are not, not off the hook, but now um, it's um, your questions. So according to the moderator guide that I got, um, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to tell you three things as you come up and share your questions. The first is um, we'd like you to speak clearly into the microphone. Um, the second is to say your name and affiliation as you ask your question. And the third is a reminder that, quote, a question takes less than 30 seconds to ask and ends in a question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so with that instruction, um, um, please come up to the microphone and share your questions. And, um, And I have incredible long wait time, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, good. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I'm Natalie. I am a literacy coach in one of the Cambridge Public Schools. Um, my question is for Linda. 
Could you go into more of the nuances um, that distinguish the South African schools um, from the the Denmark? Yeah, yeah. so I think yeah. like you had curiosity and wonder, like they, yeah. they are similar, so how are they different? Yeah, I, I think that um, they're different in the constructs that are associated with, with them. Um, so for example, in South Africa, for um, the ownership example, we were using, I believe, agency originally. Um, and teachers said, you know, I have heard that word before, but I don't necessarily know what it means in my classroom. Um, and then we decided to then take exactly what they were saying, and they were saying things like, I want my learners to own the classroom, um, own the, the lesson. Um, so I think sometimes we forget that the, the terms we use carry with, with them meaning. Um, and so by using the language that teachers themselves used um, to talk about playful learning, we were trying to represent their idea of what playful learning um, responds to rather than us saying, oh, you're just talking about agency, then that's what you must mean. Or the idea of enjoyment. Um, we could have used joy, we could have used um, delight the way that it was uh, called in Denmark, but enjoyment was the, the term, literally the term that was used most often when teachers responded. So it's our way of representing bigger constructs that come with these terms that we often use in education that we never really stop to think about. Are they being understood and used in the same way in the local context that we're working in? Um, uh, Jim Gray from the MIT Media Lab. Um, I'm working on a project. I'm thinking a lot about all of these issues uh, from the perspective of agency and guidance and having kids make something in the digital world. And I was explaining this to a thoughtful friend the other day, and she said, that's great, but I could, I could take the word play and substitute flow. I could substitute a host of other words. And I just wondered from your perspective, the word play, what value does it bring when you talk to other people and say, we should be doing more of this, when there are a thousand definitions of it, for one thing, and people interpret it in another thousand different ways. Any insights on that? I'm glad I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> but wouldn't it, we I just wrote about that in an article, yeah. so. Do you want to Well, um, not specific to play, but I'll answer it in terms of play, but I think it applies to a very long list of constructs. I mean, for those of us who are desperate to kind of be grounded in rigorous knowledge generation in science and be relevant in the world outside in terms of impact, um, getting going down a rabbit hole of arguing about terminology is a killer. So um, particularly just to, I'll take play, we, we struggle with this on how do you define executive function and what are different ways to do that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's both, I won't say love-hate, I'll say a love-uh relationship <laughs> with science is how it works so hard to, for precision and for understanding. Um, but it also means that there will never be agreement on terminology ever. Whenever you kind of feel like you've agreed on a definition, someone will come up with an alternative way to think about it that will generate a lot of interesting discussion. Um, and I don't, I'm not diminishing it, but it paralyzes you out there in the world when people say, well, we want to, we get the concept, so what do we do about it? You say, well, we have to be clear first about what the definition about what we're talking about. So, so I, I find this to be one of the challenges of how to bring those two worlds together. I mean, just speaking to Bo's points about the policy relevance, I think um, there will always be um, a lack of, of, of agreement in academia about any of these concepts. And there will always be a, could you guys just stop arguing and tell me what insights you can share? And there's, so it's, there's a need for another, another kind of body of people and stuff who kind of want to be the bridge between those two and at some point say, I totally get what you're saying. Let's just find something we can agree on and move forward. So whether it's play or flow or anything else, I, I think that could fuel a lot of really interesting scholarship. It could paralyze a kind of an action agenda about what to do. And we ought to just, we ought to divide the pie and figure out who's going to do what and keep them all moving. I will plug in um, 
just the article that we, you can read our answer directly to this question. Um, it'll come out later this um, year, and it's called The State of Play in Schools in the International Journal of Play. Um, and we answer this uh, question directly. So we can share it with you when it's published. Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, we had, like, it's nice that play is inclusive, basically, uh, yeah. and ma many different meanings. But there's a few reasons why we had to, to basically debug it and define it. And one way is because when people usually think about play, it's only for young children. Mm. Uh, or it's only about recess and outdoors. So we basically had to kind of debug and define it in a way that, that was about engagement, enjoyment, and experimentation uh, based on the literature we have looked at to be able to figure out how does it fit into education and lifelong learning, not only for, for young children. And the second reason is that policymakers like are just scared about word play. It, yeah. it is a four-letter word that doesn't open any doors anyway. So, so we had to kind of uh, pull together evidence with a more careful language uh, that, that, that actually uh, articulate in a, in a better way. So if you want to teach to it, if you want to measure it, if you want to support it, we, we actually have need a better language to, to, to communicate among the different audiences. Yeah. You've been very patient, so go ahead. Hi, I'm Gia. I'm a current student at the Graduate School of Education. Um, there was some talk about playful learning for adults, and I was wondering if you could share more within your organizations or in your teams how you incorporate playful learning uh, within those contexts and spaces to create that environment where you work. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of uh, work with materials, um, you know, not, um, not fancy, just mm -hmm. just moving, uh, you know, manipulating things with hands and having conversations. Um, we do a lot of uh, bringing artifacts from the classroom together as adults and having conversation that's open and, um, you know, there's an, an, a set agenda other than to ask more questions. Um, we talk about the value of thinking in questions um, as sort of the goal of the work. Um, so. You know, I think it, this question of using the word play, I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's just about not, I like the word because it's, it's not a word to be afraid of, I think, and I think we should really work towards a, an ability to use it in all these different contexts, um, whether with adults or children, uh, because it's such a fundamental behavior, the birthright of our species, right? And so um, we should... Uh, not, yeah, not be so afraid of it. I, you know, I loved your comment from Jerome Bruner about um, education, making it less dangerous. You know, I, I mean, for me, having spent my life, I'm a pediatrician by training, and I spent the early part of my career in that world, kind of moved into policy stuff here in a school of education. In all of these domains, um, uh, failure is not something that's uh, given any value. And in areas where uh, innovation happens and where things change, people celebrate learning from failure. Um, and I know in my, in my class once, when I mentioned this, someone got up and said, I've been in it, the education world for 15 years. It's the first time I've ever heard anybody say it's OK to fail. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other thing about play, that as adults, we not only need to learn, we need to unlearn the way we've been socialized as adults, where failure is not an option. And failure is kind of the name of the game in terms of learning through play. I think that's a, it's not safe. It's dangerous mm -hmm. to kind of fail in the world that most of us live in, and that's a big problem when it comes to learning through play. I think what, what I said before in terms of workforce and like skills and like any, any business nowadays need to think about play in the mm -hmm. way they motivate and engage employees, the way they share and encourage new ideas to solutions, the way they encourage collaborations. Uh, the way they encourage multiple materials to represent ideas. So in the meeting rooms, you have materials and boards and, and new technologies to share things. Um, in the Lego company, we also have a global play day. So all employees, one time a year, spend all day playing and meeting colleagues and so forth. And even in our board meetings, uh, we're doing games. Uh, so in Lego Foundation board meetings, we're doing scenarios and games to engage our board members. Else, people won't speak up and people don't like share ideas and, and, and listen to each other. Yeah. Yeah, so I think safety is really the name of the game. In no species will uh, an individual under threat engage in play. So if we think about our workspaces or workplaces mm -hmm. as being safe places to um, try out new ideas, in my experience at Project Zero, I think that that's 
um, the experience we have where we're able to share drafts of things without feeling uh, attacked and we get feedback of coming together with questions rather than answers. Um, and I think any place or any environment when we think about the safety of the individuals, then it's more likely that play will be taking place. So you have the last question of the evening. So. Hi, my name is Eliza. I'm in the school leadership program at HGSC. And I was just wondering, from your research, is it just usually with students of elementary age, or have you done any research or work with adolescents, maybe high school students? And then kind of where are some places or organizations or resources we can go uh, for best practices around play? Because as a future school leader, that I think this is something that's extremely important. Like, what are some go-to places we can go? So we have worked um, K through middle school mostly and some high school. Um, and you can go to the Pedagogy of Play uh, website on the Project Zero website. Um, the LEGO Foundation also has lots of um, great reports and also connections to their partners. You can speak more to this. <laughs> um, and I think some of the, the work that has been happening in all of our organizations really illustrates this. So I, you know, I think that we all have really uh, accessible websites with lots of resources. Yeah. Uh Exactly. Yeah. No, <laughs> I, I, no but, but the pedagogy of play and the Harvard Center of Development Child, we have also have a pedal hub in the University of Cambridge mm -hmm. where you can access all the latest uh, papers and so forth. I would say our, our focus at this point is not adolescence. We are usually uh, 0 to 12 at this point because it's most important to get that early childhood in place with play and the transitioning into primary school. But we do see a concern that actually adolescents are also more concern playing less earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, something that, that, that certainly needs to be addressed sooner than later. <laughs> I, I would add, mm -hmm. for a graduate student um, interested in an area and wanting to know where the good work has been mm -hmm. done, um, so you can quickly move from the disappointment mm -hmm. about whether all the work has been done to the excitement about the fact that you can do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can kind of be the one who is kind of the resource mm -hmm. for others. That's, I mean, some areas there's so much work that's been done and so many practical applications that haven't yet been figured out. So it's really, mm. it's, uh, it's, it's not too late yeah. to kind of be a real change agent mm. in this field, not just figure out who's, figured, who's got all the answers. Yeah. Maybe Tina Blake, this might be a good time for you to share uh, for people interested. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Some of you already know that at Project Zero, we work to share our research. Would you mind going to the I'm happy to use the microphone. Live stream and it will be videotaped as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Some of you know that at Project Zero we share our research in a variety of ways with educators. One of them uh, is a series of online courses and we have a brand new online mini course five weeks long that will run in the spring on the pedagogy of play. So if you'd like a little taste of the research, that's one way you can find out a little more. I have flyers. I'll leave them at each door and there's an uh, URL that you can get in touch with us uh, for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Tina. And thanks for your questions. We're um, getting to the end of our evening together. Um, and so it's time for some thanks. Um, first, um, thanks to Jared Ambrose, who is in the booth, who made the technology work seamlessly. Um, and to Jody Smith Bennett, who had the cool idea of having this um, forum. So thank you both. Um, thanks to our panelists, who have come from far and near and coming out of sabbatical for, for an evening to, to share their expertise um, with us. Um, Thanks to you, our audience, for spending time, which obviously we feel is a very important topic. Um, and I'd like to leave you with, um, it won't surprise you that here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, we are against rote learning. But my friend and colleague, Mary Krzyzewski, has developed something she calls quote learning. Um, and she likes to end a talk um, or experience with a, with a quote that might serve some inspiration. So I have a quote from you from the author E.B. White. Um, he wrote, that I wake up each morning wanting to change the world and have a good time. It makes planning the day a bit difficult. <laughs> so I would say that um, learning through play offers us educators the opportunity to change the world and also have a good time with our students. Yes, planning for it is a bit difficult, but I think when you start doing it, it's well worth it. So have a good, playful rest of your evening, and we hope that to see you in another one. So.